Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the next session of the Data Week. This session is titled Smart and Sustainable Digital Future for European Agriculture. And we have added a subtitle because it was intended to be a longer session. So finally, we got just one and a half hour and we decided to focus the discussions mainly on the concept of agriculture data spaces. So that's why we decided to add this title, this subtitle at the end. Um, let me tell you, first of all, some housekeeping rules for the session. Please, all participants, speakers and moderators will be muted. I think that you cannot talk by default, but in any case, be careful with that. If you are not speaker, please turn off your video. I have also told my speakers to turn off the video while they are not talking like this. At least we save some bandwidth. Please free, feel free to post your questions in the questions and answers box. In Woba, you will see that there are two spaces. Basically, you can use the questions and answers box, but you can also use the chat. So feel free to use both of them. We will be checking both of them periodically. Then if you would like to speak, please raise your hand. And finally, we have our colleague from BDVA, Jaco, together with us. So if there is any technical issue, please get in contact with him and he will help you to solve the problem so that you can join the session without any problem. I think that you are all used to this kind of housekeeping rules, but it's important to say that at the beginning of the session. Now, my presentation lets, my name is Nuria Dalama, I'm European Programs Manager at Atos. I'm also a member of the Board of Directors of the Big Data Value Association, and I'm coordinating the subworking group on agriculture in this association. So I'm really honored and happy to moderate this session today, which is not the first session we organize about this topic. In fact, some of you, especially the people that are members of the community, may remember that we have already organized several sessions, especially in the European Big Data Value Forum, but also in other events that we organize last Last, um, last year in the context of BDVA, but also in the context of our collaboration with other organizations. I think it's an amazing topic. And today we really want to progress a bit with respect to the discussions we had in the last sessions. You will see how. So as mentioned, I'm honored to be moderating this panel and this session. And uh, let's see how we manage because we have a good amount of speakers today. And one of the reasons is that there are so many interesting things to tell that we didn't want to ignore any of the ongoing works and activities that are happening nowadays. And we wanted to provide uh, somehow an overview of everything. Um, I would like maybe to, to give you a hint on the agenda for today. Basically, we will have two sessions. I will make this very short intro. And then we will have a first session that will be devoted to setting the scene. So we will get a, a background on some of these activities that are happening nowadays with different views. First of all, we will have Doris Marcat from the European Commission DG Agriculture, and she will provide us with the strategy of the Commission and will also tell from the point of view of the Commission uh, what is this concept of data spaces and the support that we may expect in the future in the context of the Digital Europe Programme for this concept. Then uh, we will have Martin Brinsko. Uh, he comes from the University of Borus. He is also the chair of the Open and Agile Smart Cities Alliance and is behind one very important initiative called Living in .eu, um, related to minimal interoperability mechanisms. He will tell us a bit later some more information about this. And then we will finalize this blog with Marco Turpena, who is the CEO of 1001 Lakes. And uh, he's been working on one very important paper led by the in International Data Spaces Association on design principles for data spaces. So Doris, Martin and Marco will lead us through some of this work that has already been done so that we know the baseline and the background. And then we will jump into a second session that will have much shorter presentation. So I ask all my speakers to prepare some initial position statements, some few slides, but not a full presentation. And the main intention is that we get a hint on what they are producing in terms of embryonic data spaces, building blocks, important aspects for interoperability, uh, data models, so use cases and pilots that have already been performed. And uh, the main intention of this session is not so much to discuss on which are the requirements, but try to understand what works and what doesn't work based on experiences that have already happened or that are happening nowadays. So it will be a very practical session and I hope that all of us will learn quite a lot about that. And then after all these presentations, we will check what is the time that is left. And of course, we will give priority to the audience so that you can make your questions and uh, your comments so that you can also participate in the discussion. And of course, I've also prepared some questions for our colleagues and for the audience so that we can go more in depth in some of the topics that we will target today. So the objectives for this session. 
So we, I would like to understand, um, because as you've seen that in this conference, there are lots of sessions about data spaces. So what is it specific in the context of agriculture? What is different in this sector with respect to other sectors? What do we need to take into consideration when we design a data space for agriculture? Then, uh, as mentioned before, I think that uh, many of us have been working quite a lot in the last two years on understanding the opportunities of data sharing, even though we don't have all the answers, we have more questions than answers, but still we've been talking very much about requirements, about needs, data integration, visualization, data sharing, interoperability, data sovereignty. But as mentioned before, today I want to go a step further, and besides talking about the what is needed, it would be very good to understand how we can progress on that, what can be done, what can be used. And that is the reason why, as I mentioned before, in the second session, we will get more information about the baseline, which standards are already been are already there, which building blocks can be used because projects are generating quite a lot of things. How can we do in order to reuse some of this existing work and avoid reinventing the wheel all the time, creating the same hardware and software that other projects have already produced? And what it is very important to understand based on your practical experiences, what works and what doesn't work. So don't be afraid of telling what it is an unsuccessful experience because sometimes we learn more from these unsuccessful experiences than from successful experiences. So basically this should lead us uh, to have a, a set of, uh, of building blocks and, and embryonic data spaces and learning experiences that I hope will be useful for the audience in order to design and to build data spaces in the future. Finally, as we have just half an hour, of course, this is not enough time to go through everything in detail. Some of you may think, okay, I thought that uh, they would go more in depth in this topic or another topic. It is impossible. So the intention is not to provide a complete ecosystem. I'm sure there are more projects and more initiatives. And of course, we will invite them in future sessions. But the main thing is to get this an, as a starting point and uh, to get inspiration from all of our speakers so that we can progress faster and in a more efficient way also based on the work that is already been done. I think that with this, I go to my last slide and I wanted to mention that in the context of the Big Data Value Association, we've been working heavily on data sharing. And uh, I suppose most of you know that we have published several papers. One of them uh, provides um, uh, some information about what we think are the core pillars and principles of a European data sharing space. And as you can see on this slide on the left side, basically we consider that there are some important elements that need to be considered like people, organizations, technology, and today we will see a lot on technology, but also governance and policy, and of course data as, as a main asset of the data spaces for sure. And then on the right side, which is another picture that I took also from our paper published in November 2020, we can see basically which are the stakeholders which are the mechanisms and tools that could be used by these stakeholders and the potential impact when using these tools and mechanisms. And this is quite interesting because it brings some additional elements like, for example, training or education. In previous sessions today, we saw how important skills are in order to ensure that we can get maximum advantage of these data spaces. So all these things need to be considered in order to ensure that Europe will be more competitive through these kind of instruments and mechanisms. In that with this, I already set the scene for our next speakers, and I would like to give the floor directly to my colleague from the European Commission, Doris Marcard. So the floor is yours and thank you very much for accepting the invitation and also to be with us in order to share the strategy of the European Commission with respect to data spaces in agriculture. So Doris, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah. Then to all the colleagues again, uh, don't forget that you can use the chat and the questions and answers options in WOBA. Good afternoon. Thank you also for the invitation from my side. I would like to emphasize that normally DG Acqui and DG Connect are presenting together, but today I'm alone, but it's normally joint work on the common agriculture data space. So I'm happy to present in 10 minutes. That is a challenge for that topic, okay. but I hope I can set the scene and provide a flavor of the thoughts of the European Commission on the data spaces and the agriculture data space in particular. Let's directly reflect on what is the framing conditions for an agriculture data space to evolve and what are the motivations for the agriculture sector and set up such an initiative 
in the agriculture sector, because it was already mentioned, there are several ideas and several fields for data spaces. So what is the need and the motivation to do it in agriculture? So we have for sure the Green Deal targets, the common agriculture policy with the aim of the modernization, including digitalization of the sector in rural areas. We have the data strategy. We have a digital declaration, which was signed in 2019 and already points to a data space. And there's a code of conduct in place. I think most of you in the audience know it and are aware of it, but that's only one part of the framing conditions we have to consider as a starting point for ruling out the data space. If we now reflect on agriculture of data, there are three elements which are quite decisive when thinking about a data space. Public and private data is key for the sector and digital technologies in the sector and subsequently to perform better, be it from an environmental point of view or from an economic point of view. So on the other side, agriculture data is of interest for the public and the private domain beyond the sector, not only for policymakers or for other agriculture farmers, but also for instance, up and down the supply chain. And yes, as most of you know, in the data community, data sharing and subsequently big data, which can be generated to that, offers great opportunities also in the sector. And particularly if you think about climate change, that makes a difference whether I have only farm data or data from several farms where I can really develop um, climate adaptation strategies, only to mention one example. So if we re briefly reflect on the European strategy for data, and um, there are some key features which are common for all the sectors. So the clear and fair rules of access and reuse of data is an ambition which is um, going along with all the initiatives and data spaces in the field. And using rights, tools and skills, skills were already mentioned, so capacity building beyond the concrete data initiatives that are also elements of the data strategy. And finally, to look at an internal market for data, so creation and developing a data marketplace. The strategy is framed actually by legislative, investment and strategic initiatives. So it's not only about um, one element which we can implement or a portfolio of elements, but it's not only one program, but a framework of programs and initiatives which have to fit into it, to each other. And that was also illustrated in this slide. If you look at one initiative of the data strategy, the common European data spaces, then we see already it's a portfolio of data space and it will not be limited to the number of data spaces, which are to some extent horizontal linked but on the other side, all the data spaces will have their own, let's say, governance structures, maybe also business models. The provisions for the data spaces are others, but they also have common features. For instance, the input of high value data sets will be equal and accessible for all the data spaces. What already calls attention is that even if we have here now, for instance, agriculture, or we see the Green Deal and energy data space, they are called like that but that does not necessarily mean that they really cover all the field of energy because energy could also form a subdomain of the Green Deal, for instance, meaning um, that might also be pilot projects under that headline. And this is also important for agriculture because frequently the question arises, oh, is it an agri-food data space? that would be quite ambitious at the moment. So for the moment, it's an agriculture data space, what is announced in the data strategy. And that is quite important because it will be quite challenging to interlink everything um, in a data space. For instance, we could also interlink right from the beginning agriculture with the Green Deal and so on and so forth. But that would be quite ambitious if we aim for interlinking all the domains um, horizontally right from the beginning. So meaning, the data spaces can develop independently, but are interlinked to the same times to, to common features. And I will come to that. You see at the, at the end, the horizontal framework for data spaces. So trust being one of them, but also governance standards. And we will see on that later with the act on data governance. We have already had 
some relevant proposals subsequently following the data strategy announcement. Some are more relevant, they are directly relevant for the data spaces, others less. But particularly the first one on the slide, the AIMLIC framework with the governance of common European data spaces or the act on data governance is quite important and we will come to that on the next slides. If you look at the end of the slide, forthcoming is also an implementing act on high value data sets and the open data directive, which will also be quite decisive for the agriculture data space. And then finally, if you look here at the end of the slide, the data act will also be one determinant. So briefly reflecting on the acts, which actually frame all the data spaces and all data sharing transactions independently, whether they are assigned to a common European data space or not. The first one is a, a data act. So main ambitions are really to facilitate the conditions for data sharing and reuse. And it's particularly focused on the reuse of sensitive public sector data. Then an ambition to providers of data sharing and as a trusted intermediary. So to have, let's say, third party data sharing services. A mechanism for data altruism, meaning that more data can be shared. You may remember the personal data spaces, which may feed into common data spaces. And then the creation of a European data innovation board. And that is also quite decisive when we said at the beginning, um, there are horizontal elements linking the different data spaces so that there's communication, for instance, on common data needs and standards. So, and such a common um, European data innovation board um, could think about and horizontally over all the data spaces, but that is still commission proposal and under discussion. Then the data act um, is announced in the data strategy as for clarifying the access of public sector to the private health data. So the flexibility to use big data is envisaged. It's still to be published. The second element, which is quite relevant for the agriculture sector, is the clarification of rights and access and the use of data um, of IoT co-generated data. So that is still evolving legislation and which will also shape indirectly or directly um, the shape of the common agriculture data space or influence the governance structures and mechanisms in it. If we now look at the high value data sets, um, they are, have been selected because they have important benefits for economy and society. And they should be available free of charge, machine readable format and provided via APIs. So, and the ambition is to make them directly available for all the data spaces to be used. So the implementing act on the high value data sets is still under preparation. And the sets are still to be defined, the concrete data sets. But what is already clear are the domains. So it will be about geospatial data, earth observation and environmental data sets, meteorological data, statistical data. And you see already at least four of those categories are pretty relevant for an agriculture data space as input data. So meaning the common agriculture data space has a fair chance to very well benefit from public data input. If you now look at the common European agriculture data space, as it has been proposed, it's a spawn data space and a set of data spaces. And the main ambition is to facilitate the trustworthy sharing and pooling of data for the sector. It also has the potential to provide a basis for research and innovation, of to provide policy um, relevant information, but that is not set into stone. The commission has acknowledged that potential, but the decision on the final use of the data space is up to stakeholders and member states. What has the commission said is the announcement that in the development of the data space, the experience gained with the code of conduct of agriculture data sharing by contractual agreement should be taken into consideration. So meaning the concrete design is still to be defined, including interoperability mechanisms, data and data contributions, or also the extent of common good proposals it may contribute to. As you know, it's supported under the forthcoming Digital Europe program. 
And if you look at that concrete, oh, sorry, you look and slide back. So, so for the preparation of the Common European Dat Agriculture Data Space, we had in 2020 a series of webinars. And I think I can thank many participants and contributed to this webinar again, because we had very active contributions by many Horizon 2020 projects, but also by stakeholders. And that is really appreciated and helpful. And I think personally, it was a very, very, very valuable discussion. It was also subject of the as agriculture data and the data space was also subject of the German Council presidency. And what was clear from the discussion? There is on the one hand already a number of pilot projects and commercial initiatives already ongoing in the field of agriculture data sharing and pooling. But it would be challenging to directly hold out and write a concept down for the agriculture data space, which would account for, for instance, the existing initiatives, including for instance, smaller bonds we may not directly be aware of. And it would also be challenging to develop governance structures serving the interests of all types of farms and stakeholders. So what the commission decided is that for the agriculture data space, we will not go in the direct implementation phase or in the implementation project, but the commission has proposed for the first work program of the Digital Euro program, a so-called coordination and support action, meaning that action like a coordination and support action similar to those which may you may know from Horizon 2020 to develop a concept and approach to the data space. Because we think more time for stock taking, what is already out there, what has been done, which needs are there, which interests are there from the private and public domain is needed to develop a profound approach. And yes, from our side, we can only say it is welcome if more stakeholders contribute to the development of the data space. So if you look on the top of the slide, then there is a common support under the Digital Europe program for the later implementing action, which is common to several data spaces. For instance, what is supported is the deployment of data sharing tools and platforms, the creation of data governance frameworks, and also horizontally the improving the observability, quality, and interoperability of data. It was mentioned at the beginning, and I will not go into detail, but I would only like to highlight that for creating an agriculture of data in Europe, more is needed than a common agriculture data space. So much more capacity building, particularly as it regards skills um, in the farming sector. Um, that is, does not stop with the agriculture data space. That is one means, one important one. And we also can see that the agriculture data space may well fit into a portfolio of policy instruments. It can be well supplemented by other forthcoming or announced and already ongoing policy initiatives. So we have seen over the last year how effectively Horizon 2020 projects have already contributed to the, let's say, development or brainstorming of a data space, how it could look like, and we have feasible results. There will be more actions under Horizon Europe, which will directly or indirectly contribute to the development of the data space. Noteworthy, a partnership agriculture of data, which is to foster on using earth observation data and data technologies for the agriculture sector. Then the Digital Euro program, you know also that it's supplementing by the data space by testing and experimentation facilities for AI but also capacity building for advanced digital skills, for instance. And then under the common agriculture policy, that's the application level, the farmer's level, so the less strategic level, but so the end user oriented. We have the support to advisory services, training, investment support, innovation support. So it's a whole portfolio of instruments and we have to see that they well supplement each other, which is not for sure, uh, sometimes under shared management with member states, sometimes in the, under the management of the commission, direct management. Only to provide a flavor on the Horizon Europe Candidate Partnership Agriculture of Data, that's really about 
um, two objectives on research and innovation. So that's not about like for the data space later of deployment and implementation, but we stay at the level of research and innovation. And the principal objectives are using the possibilities offered by data technologies in the field of agriculture and earth observation data and environmental observation to provide support to the improvement of sustainability performance of the agriculture sector and to improve the capacities for policy monitoring and evaluation. And there you already see potential interlinks because such a partnership could develop um, the potential of a data space, how the data could later be capitalized, what could be done or assessed with the data set in a data space. So both initiatives could go hand in hand depending on how the data space is developed. And it will be important that those ongoing initiatives beyond the data space are considered when developing the data space. So for this partnership, I will not go into detail, but who is interested, we will have a webinar tomorrow, a stakeholder webinar on that partnership. And with that, I say thanks and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Doris. In fact, you did it quite well for so much information that you have provided. It is true that it was a long presentation. Just a very quick question. The first one is a clarification. I saw in your presentation that data should be released for free. Am I right or, or not? In the context um, of the data space, you expect that data is yes. available? For so if I come to the high value data sets, which are currently so we have the Open Data Directive and in the Open Data Directive, an Implementing Act on high value data sets um, is announced. And this Implementing Act is currently under preparation. And in that act, data sets are identified, public data sets, which are already available, sometimes for free in some member states, but sometimes not for free and currently also in different formats. And the intention with that act on high value data sets is that those data sets which are currently decided on, for instance, um, we may have satellite data or certain, could be about a soil map or something. And you say, okay, for all member states, we would have would like to have it free of charge, downloadable, click. I would like to have that data set for whole Europe. So that is pragmatically speaking or very simplified speaking envisaged with that um, implementing act. So that there is a certain set of data really available um, for Europe free of charge and, and what's also important, easily accessible, because sometimes such data sets you have to request, for instance, and until you do that or you work at European scale and not only in your country and you would like to have AI applications all over Europe, then it's much more um, comfortable and usable if you have the so-called high value data sets. Mm -hmm. Okay, that applies to that kind of data. This doesn't prevent different stakeholders to monetize their data. No, there could be no, 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 no. That really applies. So public data sets which are identified and as indicated. So under the data strategy and under the act on data governance, um, it's, it's also envisaged to have data marketplaces. So that is then maybe your personal data or your business data, which you may capitalize. Mm -hmm. Or you may also decide that it's a data algorithm to donate your data. So for instance, if you now say in the COVID crisis, um, you would like to give your personal data for research purposes under the act of data governance, also mechanisms are proposed um, to facilitate the trust in data sharing and data donation at the personal level that you know, okay, I can trust that organization that's certified and I'm ready to donate my data for research purposes which mm -hmm. might be particularly a crucial decision if it comes to health or financial aspects that you are thinking twice about, should I share my data, my personal data, yes or no? Mm -hmm. Okay, that is clear. I have many questions, but since we don't have time, I will make just a very quick one on semantics. Should we talk about a data space in singular or data spaces in plural? And then why are we using this word common? Oh, <laughs> refer to the data spaces. I think that is because a good no question. No one asked about that, but I have that doubt from the very beginning. <laughs> no, um, I think that is fair. And I think it's quite similar to the word market. You can have a market which is abstract and where you see it as one. And you can have the same like a space. You could even for all sectoral data spaces, you could say it is one space if you interlink it. 
Mm. And for the agriculture data space, I would say if we are talking about a common European agriculture data space, then it's a space where we have similar rules and which are at least, for instance, platforms which are interlinkable. But um, there is, as far as I know, um, no from the Commission side, no common definition yet for data spaces. So there is no common definition for the common European data spaces. Okay. Um, but I think that is an important one. And for the agriculture data space, I would say what is important to know, and that is what I highlighted, what will be a challenge. There are already platforms in place. And not to exclude one of them, meaning making, for instance, a federation of platforms, which are all then part of a data space, which then have some common framing rules to, for instance, interchange some of the data, or they have the same um, governance mechanism overarching. That is still a common data space integrated with platforms. And that is why we say, okay, it's not easy to develop a governance structure, but um, it has to be done profoundly and then serves the different needs. And that is why we say, okay, we make a coordination and support action to well prepared. Mm -hmm. Okay, fully understood. Let's see if we have time at the end of the session, because uh, again, I have quite a lot of questions. Uh, it is a, a very interesting topic, but let's go now to Martin. Thank you very much, Doris. I think that you made a very good link because in your presentation, you have used the word interoperability several times. So I think that uh, Martin, who knows quite a lot about interoperability, is going to illustrate some of the ongoing works and also some of the experience coming among others from, from other sectors that can be extrapolated or at least we can learn from there and uh, they can be applied maybe also to the agriculture sector in order to speed up uh, some of these developments. Uh, so Martina, I don't know how I should introduce you before I used a lot of labels because uh, basically you are chair of the Open and ILS Smart Cities Alliance, you work for the University of Aarhus, you are behind this initiative of living in .eu together with other colleagues and uh, leading these minimal interoperability mechanisms. So the floor is yours and uh, let's uh, tell us a bit about how this experience uh, that you have in the smart cities can be extrapolated to agriculture and also some of the findings, uh, because uh, you are leading several initiatives working with some uh, projects in agriculture, what is uh, what has come out of this discussion so far? Thanks a lot, Nuria, and, and thanks, Doris, for the uh, excellent overview and for actually posing all the good questions. So is there one data space or many or and all of that? So I, I would take a territorial view, and I think this is what we have been doing over the years. Actually, the term smart cities is not very helpful. Um, I mean, like I put here, uh, smart communities also need to eat. So I, I would take a territorial and functional approach on this because I think we really need to be precise uh, when we talk about what is it actually that we want to link? What is it actually that we want to um, uh, put together uh, in these common uh, spaces? Uh, yeah, so my name is Martin Brunskow, as you said, uh, Nuria, um, I just want to point out also that I'm chairing the, the technical subgroup in the Living in the EU uh, initiative, where actually we try to have a forum uh, of, of, you know, consolidating uh, from, you could say, the ground, um, how these different uh, sectors and systems, um, they can be formulated as capabilities we would like to have in our systems. Um, then I'm also... Uh, coordinating the uh, technical uh, development between some of the, the newer uh, projects uh, in the uh, smart uh, rural communities. Um, and I'm part of, of one of them as a partner, D Rural, um, and also uh, working on the gap analysis. Uh, this is the stand ICT uh, EU uh, standards observatory. So can we see what, what kind of standardization is uh, needed? I'm not going to talk so much about that here. Maybe just uh, make the claim that standards will not save us, at least not standards with a big capital S. Uh, we have to be very uh, practical and pragmatic about this hence the territorial perspective. Um, just from, from the, the network perspective, so uh, OASC, Open Agile Smart Cities and Communities, as it, it's been proposed now, is actually, um, it doesn't care about what kind of uh, processes around uh, life and economy and the green is being facilitated. So the partnerships that we have engaged in are quite diverse, but of course coming from the 
would say, mm, digital side. So not from the sectors, whether it's energy or agri-food or health or something, but, but the transversal ones. So just want to point that out. Um, and uh, while we are uh, situated in, we have headquarters in Brussels, actually it's a global organization, uh, always representing the, the demand side. So, so small municipalities and very large ones, you know, among the biggest in the world. And, and really what everyone agrees on is that we need to find out is, you know, what's the balance between a very hands-off approach where the market in a way just does its thing and then we find out how to share data and you know there will be business and consequences and politics around it or you know very hands-on where it's you know almost dictated what happens so how can we how can we find a good balance uh, which you know resonates with what we want uh, to do in europe and um what what we have been working on uh, and and the you know, the baseline for me and for us and in going into this, this discussion is what is the, the minimal but sufficient level of interoperability between these systems? Because that is actually following the data. The interoperability is flows of data. And I mean, many of you probably know like the, the basic ones with, with context information management and data models and, and marketplace and so on. But just to say that, that we are working with the established baselines, the baselines that, that are already, um, you know, the starting point for everyone. So with, with the Inspire Directive and OGC and so on uh, for, the, for the geospatial and, and uh, you know, uh, my data and solid for the personal data management. So, so when you come to the local level, um, on the public side, half of the systems contain personal data. And actually, um, so since we're talking about, you know, the agri-food uh, data space, so um, it is increasingly difficult to rule out that there will be personal data um, involved. So uh, first point I want to make is that it's, uh, it's increasingly difficult to say, oh, this is just production or this is just, you know, something simple. So the complexity is coming to all systems. And the good place to start with that is, you know, to look at some uh, situations where we have traditionally, historically, you know, had to, to, to treat all cases, um, both with personal data and without personal data, with, with uh, freely accessible data, not free, but freely accessible um, with closed data sets. So this integrated approach really speaks to trying to figure out what are the capabilities we want in all systems. So we are concretely working now much more uh, focused on the geospatial, uh, the security. Everybody knows what happens if ransomware or, you know, uh, a cyber attack. Uh, hit you and on the indicators. So how do we actually uh, prove or monitor that what we invest in actually also uh, has an effect uh, either, you know, social, uh, environmental or, or on the economic side. And just to say very simply, so this is an example, what do these MIMS then enable, you know, the community to do if you have a data flow or data uh, spaces that are operated? Well, basically, you have a voice. You can say, this is actually how we think uh, stuff should be governed and so on. And this is the case with the Microsoft uh, uh, Digital Twins uh, uh, definition language, which is, well, we brought the, the voice of cities together with many other colleagues, of course, but to one of the biggest players in the world say, actually, we think this is the way it would be good if, if we structured things so. Just to, to say very simply, this is it. And this is, of course, the same as, as you would do to the you know, John Deere or uh, what, you're, what you're doing with the, the um, uh, ACRI information models. And so there's very practical work going on, as you said, uh, Nuria. So this is in the context of IoT. So we have thematic workshops and we discussed exactly this point about semantic interoperability many other contexts as well. And what we're doing now is that we're bringing this together. But there's a little bit of, yeah, it's it's not so simple, let's put it in that way, to then fold that onto the ground, to the territorial perspective, which is also uh, what I uh, I saw you very much taking as the basis, um, uh, Doris, uh, in, in your opening. And uh, so in, in, in Europe, there are uh, many ways to approach the territorial, and it's actually not one of the the simplest in the EU uh, you know, world. So there's 
Of course, there's uh, the rural development. We know that and very much tied also to the, the Yakri side. But, but then there's also something like the urban agenda and the new Leipzig charter, which was just put out by the, uh, the, the German presidency. And actually it has exactly this uh, nature of the triple baseline plus the digital which we somehow need to figure out. So you could say this is the anticipation. This is the, the conceptual space that data must exist in. And uh, actually it's, it's very nicely reflected here it says in the city, but it, I mean, that's kind of nonsensical because it's just everywhere where there's a, a local government, which is everywhere. And so how does it, it, it work on a neighborhood level? So people, uh, how does it work on a local authority level? Um, so governance and how is the functional area of this? And this is important because what we want is actually to have these data spaces work, right? So we have to have a functional perspective just to say that this is actually one of the, I think, quite useful models that we can take forward when we are looking at these data spaces. Now, what's happening is that every nation, member state, every local um, regional um, and sometimes even municipality, they are doing their own things. So while initiatives are coming on the European level, um, how do we get some kind of uh, alignment between this? And this is the context where we uh, see the Living EU initiative. Just a very concrete example, because I'm involved. Uh, so Denmark has created a guide to sustainable digital transformation. Um, it is out uh, next month in uh, uh, English. And just to say, Recommendation number one is to focus on data. So the data spaces will be quite central to actually everything we do. So the life cycle management of data is central. How do we that bring that meaningfully, not just as a bureaucratic exercise, but meaningfully up to the European level? That is the challenge. And in Living in EU, not to go into a lot of details, but there are five areas and well, one I'm most involved in is the technical ones. And basically it's, it's saying on the European level, if we have this idea of minimal interoperability, how can we not just express it, but also link it to the existing uh, directives and specifications that we use in Europe. So that's actually the main function of this. And this is an, uh, an uh, initiative by you know, several networks together with the Commission, Committee of the Regions and, and others. This is a little bit conceptual, but just to see, you know, what is a data space compared to a data platform compared to, you know, digital twins. And I don't think we have the time here, but maybe we can we can go into that later to actually understand. I mean, data spaces don't exist in in the thin air. It, they they run on data is is maintained and exchanged on platforms. And then you can say the digital twins. I'm talking about that green box here. The digital twins are then, you know, the most complex uh, um, uh, situation where data is flowing and is modeled and used for all kinds of transactions and predictions and so on. <clears throat> but actually, we don't have if we move then to the, the red part of this, and it's red because it's the, in the most problematic, we don't have yet good communities of practice that actually um, are used to working with um, data sharing practices. We of course know, so, you know the internet and oh, we can share data, um, the semantic web knowledge graphs and so on. But, but this has very little to do with the actual practical value networks that we are creating because it's, it's in a way so um, idealistic and ideal. So what we're, what we're seeing now unfolding along these uh, data spaces and the communities around it. It's a, we need to understand, so what are the practices we are developing around these? And that's a quite concrete thing we need to do. And well, just to give an example, so um, the digital twins, uh, we, we're starting to learn uh, how everything in a way becomes part of a digital twin. And of course, there will be many, right? I mean, if you have a, a a farm, a big farm, it, it will have, you know, the, the amount of digital twins that are smaller municipality would have. So there's structurally no real difference, but we need to understand. So will this tap into many data spaces or one, or, I mean, how is this? So it's, it's quite fluid um, still, but what is very clear, and this is, you know, from one of the sessions that the commission uh, organized on, on uh, local digital twins, which is, which is essentially the territorial perspective 
when all these data spaces come together. And well, you can see that the minimal interoperability together with trust and different kinds of disciplines is really at the center. <clears throat> and now that is being uh, referenced, it's good to see. I'm very glad to see now it's slowly um, being referenced in the uh, uh, commission uh, legislative train. So this was the updated communication on AI and, and in this uh, part for public sector. But we should not think that just because this complexity mm, is relevant for the public sector, it doesn't go for the agri sector, if you will. Actually, everybody is facing, all sectors are facing this complexity. So I think it might be a good idea actually to look in the public sector part when you're uh, approaching it from the other data spaces. So a couple of, of final uh, references, maybe just to leave if there is any uh, conversations we can have about that. <clears throat> so, you know, there is the European interoperability framework, uh, which has been around for quite some years and that's being updated now and we actually with a territorial um, view on it. So not sectorial, but territorial. And of course, there's technical, but also semantic interoperability, as well as organizational, legal, and interestingly, cultural interoperability. So it's, it's an attempt to really capture the context that these data spaces need to exist in. And then there is a modest but ambitious attempt to find out so what is sectorial what is vertical and what is horizontal and not to go into a lot of details but just to say that these kind of efforts are ongoing and quite often they are not um, seen from the other sectors but I think I mean Doris we have also exchanged uh, in the context of the um, uh, smart rural communities how important it is to see both so this t-shape now, in the consultation on the uh, EIF for uh, smart cities and communities, actually food wasn't there. <laughs> so apparently the food flows are just meant to be, you know, happening, which of course is insane. Uh, so, I mean, there's, there's still some um, uh, adjustments uh, to be made. So uh, my almost final slide, this is my uh, second final slide. <clears throat> so this is the parallel data space for the Green Deal. When you see my um, which, image, that means that you have to accelerate a bit. <laughs> okay, but this I have one one slide after this. Just to say that that I, I think what, what we're trying to do from the territorial side, which is the way that I, I see this data space on the Green Deal, which is on smart communities. Um, I think it is very, very connected to the issues that we are looking at for the, uh, the, the ACRI um, uh, data space. So I would be very much in favor if we could try and see um, how we could learn from how the different data spaces are being set up uh, with a territorial uh, aspect. And this is um, the final slide. And just to say that actually with some of the colleagues, I, I saw that uh, Kevin um, from uh, Demeter is here, um, others are involved. We're trying to put from the, you know, straight up smart farming or agri-food uh, projects, as well as those kind of in between. So the uh, smart rural communities, but not agri, but rural in general, and the more uh, the general smart communities or smart city communities, trying to put together the learnings we have so far so that we have a baseline we can put in. I think it's going quite well. I mean, the actual writing uh, takes time, but it's now showing up that there was a super nice uh, Portuguese presidency event with the uh, smart rural uh, communities and smart regions. Now for Slovenia, we are, we're doing that as well. And we hope uh, this is ongoing. So the Living EU initiative is meant to, <clears throat> you know, capture the uh, needs, uh, the requirements, if you will, for uh, data spaces and <clears throat> data management more broadly from all sectors, including uh, the agri-food. So that's my final word. And uh, sorry, Noria, if it was a little bit verbose, but I stay here also for the comments. Well, thank you very much for putting some additional elements on the table. Two very quick questions, Martin, because I see that we are doing very badly with the time. Um, one of them is that you have mentioned this white paper. When do you think this will be available for the colleagues? Our hope is that it should also be out in June. So, so in time for the, uh, the launch of the Horizon and Digital Europe programs. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the second one is that you are also very much engaged in some road mapping activities related to IoT and also cloud and edge computing. 
um, we have not, um, we don't have time to talk about infrastructure and some other technical elements here in this session. But, uh, you know, many times when we talk about data spaces, we assume that there is also a, a physical infrastructure, including computing infrastructure below, as it is, for example, the, the structure of Gaia X that includes basically the computing infrastructure and then the data spaces. Um, do you think that, uh, for example, aspects like um, lack of um, right communication technologies and, and some other limitations are a key factor to develop data spaces in agriculture. Is this aspect of the main infrastructure elements key for the development of a data economy in agriculture? Mm -hmm. So this is the yellow um, box that I didn't talk about, <clears throat> what we could call the computing continuum. I think actually that the, the agricultural sector is the front runner. So when I talk to cities and they want to infrastructure, you know, parks and, you know, physical spaces, they usually go to the agri uh, sector to understand what can really be done. So no, I think that's not a blocking factor for agriculture. Mm -hmm. I think it's a blocking factor for society at large, but it's the learning between the sectors which needs to happen. And that I think is, is quite important. So we should not build systems on top of the established sectors. We should understand that these are data flows. So that's the important part. No, I think agriculture is actually in the lead, to be very honest. Okay, thank you very much. So thanks, Martin. Let's go now to Marco. Marco Turpainen is the CEO of 1001 Lakes. Thank you very much, Marco, to be here. I think that today you will also tell us something quite interesting because there has been uh, for many months an ongoing work in uh, designing principles for data spaces. And uh, there is already a report that has been produced by the community and that includes a concrete chapter on agricultural data spaces. And uh, I think that you are telling us today about this work, no? a, a very summarized version at least. <laughs> and also Absolutely. your experience with data spaces in Finland, because I know that there you have a, also a lot of work on this topic. Exactly. Well, let's see how much I have time for all of this. Uh, and and uh, I, uh, let's try to uh, keep it in schedule. But I'm, I'm really happy to be uh, here. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Nuria. Uh, also, uh, thank you, uh, Doris and Martin. It's, it's, it's exciting and easy to follow from your presentations because there are already so many uh, links to what I'm going to say, but also a very, very excellent, excellent presentations from both. Uh, so um, so I'm, I'm Marko Turpenen, uh, CEO of a company called Thousand and One Lakes. Uh, we, are, we want to be trusted enabler of, uh, of data ecosystems. And uh, I also do have another hat, so uh, a little bit like Martin. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in, in Alta University, uh, University in the Helsinki region. Um, but um, let me start by a couple of viewpoints before I go to the actual design principles. So when we think about design principles for data spaces, so, so, so how should we frame this? And uh, I took as a starting point this seminal paper by uh, Porter and Heppelman, and they just happened to be using agriculture as an example of the transformation that we are going through. And then this was uh, 2014. If you haven't read it, uh, you know, I, I strongly recommend it because it really kind of sets the, 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 the larger frame of what's happening, what's happening in the industries, what's happening in the ecosystems, how we are moving from the sort of a simple product like tractor to an increasing level of complexity, uh, sort of connected products, product systems, and eventually systems of systems. And how do we then design for these systems of systems? We already heard of this kind of a situation that, well, we can look at agriculture as such, but it's connected obviously to food, but it's also connected to logistics. It's also connected to finance. It's also connected to green deal. It's connected to the, the, the communities, smart communities. So how do we de design for this sort of a, a potential to grow and a potential to link these systems or systems together? I think that's the big challenge. Then Again, when you look at the different principles, so you could take different viewpoints of, you know, whose viewpoint you are taking in terms of, uh, of how do you design. And you can start from, let's say, organizational point of view, which can be public or private organizations. But typically, they have their proprietary data. The next layer is sort of confidential data. We want to be very secret about this. We have, want to have the, the, the agreements to govern, you know, who can see the data and who cannot. But there is a kind of a boundary around that, that you know, that this is the data 
that we want, we want to keep confidential. And the next layer is distributed data. I've called it here distributed data, meaning that the, the, the original source of the information, the organization wants to retain control. So kind of, you know, it's not confidential, but we want to know who uses it, for what purposes, we want to be in control of the data. And then there is the world of open data. And when we talk about data spaces, it really is this sort of, it's the confidential, it's the distributed, it's the open data. And often these also get a little bit mixed and, 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 and sometimes in a confusing way. But all of those are involved when we talk about data spaces. Then um, the other view is network centric view. I've actually simplified this picture from the architecture pictures of, of uh, International Data Space Association. But there the idea is that you have this trusted space of you know, parties, members, who have kind of agreed on rules. This is what we do with the data. And there can be three members or there can be 30,000 members. It doesn't make, make a difference, but all of them are connected to this data, data space. And then there can be these intermediaries that facilitate somehow these interactions. They can be brokers, they can be kind of clearing houses, uh, different roles, but, but in, in general. So there is this trusted world and then there is an untrusted world for this particular ecosystem, for this particular network. And then the third viewpoint is to think about individual centric or human centric view on data and and, and my data was men mentioned already earlier i'm very happy about that because you know in my especially the alto uh, roles so i was there when the my data movement started uh, uh from finland actually uh but and and uh, also well, i have to mention it but 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 since martin mentioned mims so over the last couple of weeks and, and months, so we've been working on the, the meme for personal data management. So a heads up, Martin, uh, there's a meme coming your way. Uh, but uh, uh, so, so the point here is that, that from the individual's point of view, so it doesn't really matter which sector the data is from. I mean, but if I, I want my data to be used in a meaningful service, let's say that I want to track my CO2 footprint. So I want to have, want to have my retail data, my, my mobility data, my energy data, all of these different data so that I can have the right kind of a service. And I don't care what, what sector it is as long as the, the service makes sense. So, so that's, and, and the, the individual should be in control. So um, that leads me to this paper. So uh, a fairly recent uh, published at the end of April, um, uh, about 40 experts got together under the umbrella of Open uh, Digitizing European Industry Project, Open DEI, and, uh, and IDSA, International Data Spaces Association, was, uh, 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 was uh, coordinating this activity. Um, so I'm kind of proud of this paper. I think uh, it, it really is the first time that we try to get together these principles of what makes, you know, what, what should be the design principles and building blocks for data spaces, our current best effort to understand what's needed. And then there are a couple of um, more kind of um, deep dives into sectors. So when um, Nuria mentioned that there is a sector on agriculture, so indeed I was writing uh, that uh, for the paper, but so where uh, uh, Mariana Faraldi, for example, from Italy, and uh, and Harald Zunmek uh, from ATB Bremen. So, so there was, a, you know, part part of this expert expert group was very, you know, expert in the area of of agriculture. Um, but the paper tries to kind of really paint this picture across all different sectors, across uh, any kind of data space. What kind of design, design principles should we have? So let's go to, through the four design principles first. So the first one, and this has been mentioned already in this session earlier, but data sovereignty. So again, the control should be at the source. It's the organization, it's the person that you know, really provides the data. It's the data provider for others. So that should be the place of control. And then that, I think it's the key point of, of data sovereignty. And, in our current data ecosystems, in our current data economy, this is not at all always the case currently. Uh, and so there's plenty of work still to be done. And if applying this to the agriculture sector, so again, uh, there are many kinds of data, but for example, so what are fair ways for the farmers uh, uh, who provide and, 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 and create a lot of data? Uh, so what are the, the, the rightful ways, the, 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 the fair ways of controlling data? 
the next one, data level playing field. So we don't want to end up in monopolistic situations. The competition should be based on who has the best services, who can provide the best quality data, not who gets the most data, who, who can kind of, you know, amass the most most uh, you know, biggest biggest data and uh, of course we are in a, in a, in, a, in an event by a big data value association but anyway the point here is that uh, that yes we need a lot of data but the competition in the end shouldn't be about you know who is able to get most of the data so that we need to design the, the, the systems in such a way that that quality and service is the is the the, the, the competition um, uh, that, that's where the competition happens. The third principle, decentralized software infrastructure. So when we th think about the building blocks, the, the, so they should be distributed, interoperable as much as possible. And those building blocks can be functional, technical, operational, legal uh, building blocks. So not only technology, but the idea is that we need to have these, you know, uh, structures which are built of, you know, interchangeable blocks. And that helps us to, to, to create systems which are interoperable, portable, uh, the data becomes more findable. We have more security, better privacy and trust, so forth. So, so, so that that's the third. And then the fourth is that uh, that when we govern these spaces, so good principle is that we combine both public and private bodies, and why not also the citizens in the same uh, governance structure? So, so, so overseeing how data spaces are built and what are the building blocks. So there should be a, a, a good balance between public and private actors. Um, so those were the four design principles. Then maybe a, a little bit of a deeper dive into this picture, which uh, then uh, illustrates some, some uh, aspects of those building blocks and how these different three layers work. And, uh, and, and I will zoom in, so uh, uh, be patient. But uh, so the, the, the top level is thinking about the ecosystems that are built on top of the second layer, which are the data spaces, which typically we at, at least now think of them as more like domain specific, like agriculture data space. And underneath the third layer, the bottom layer, layer is the, the, the building blocks, the common set of soft infrastructure building blocks. And, and, uh, um, and now let's start with the third one. So, so here um, it's divided in interoperability, trust, the value of data and governance structures. And again, some of these are highly technical. Some of these are much more like Okay, here is you know legislation, for example, that helps us to govern in this and this way. So it's a it's a mixture of different kinds of building blocks, and I don't have time to go through all of these, but maybe I'll just show couple couple of ones in the trust area. So it says identity management, access and usage control, and trusted exchange. So here uh, the two first ones. So we might want to rethink how do we uh, uh, manage identities. There's a lot of good work going on in decentralized ident identities right now. Trust over IP, ID Union is, a, is an initiative starting from Germany. And, and, uh, and, and there's just an example that, that there might be need still to rethink how do we do a more decentralized way of, of identity management. And on the right-hand side, so you have the data usage policies. So, so the point here being that uh, how can we be much, much more kind of, uh, you know, specific and, and fine-grained on what can be done with the data? Who can do what with the data? And, and how do we enforce these different rules on and, and, and these control mechanisms on what can be done with the data? So again, both of these are still very much in the drawing board and they are good pilots and everything, but, uh, but we, we need to get these actually implemented, these trusted building blocks. Um, implemented in real systems and real data spaces. The second layer is this more, let's say, uh, um, domain specific, specific layer of data spaces. So for example, in agriculture, we might take, you know, some blocks might have a little bit more emphasis and maybe we need to have a specific block for that, that particular sector because for example, in metadata, you just use certain kinds of metadata standards that are specific for, for example, agriculture. Uh, but this is sort of that you kind of combine for the data space the right blocks. 
Uh, and this was already mentioned by Doris, but uh, for example, in EU uh, code of conduct uh, uh, for, for agricultural data. So, so a lot of these principles for the domain of agri has already been agreed. So this is a very, very good starting point for what then actually needs to be done more on a kind of practical and technical uh, uh, level. And then um, the third level, so the, the ecosystem level. So here, uh, really, when we think about the actual use cases, the actual businesses, how the different organizations are then forming on top of these sort of the common data space, the, the let's say the business ecosystems. So then for each and every one of these, so there can be a kind of a set of additional rules, a set of uh, kind of something that, that, that ties those players that use case together and also provides links across industries and across domains. And here I just want to mention some work that we've done in Finland, uh, which I'm kind of quite proud of. So this uh, fair data economy rulebook work, which is kind of, uh, it's an open, uh, open uh, template. Anybody can use that. Uh, 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 you can find it, find it in, in Citra's uh, website. Citra is the Finnish uh, innovation fund. Uh, but, but, but this combined the different viewpoints but also helps uh, in practice with with the legal side so 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 there are you know uh, there are contract uh, templates that that any use case that wants to share data could basically start from and uh, and one endorsement for this is that uh, IDSA in its own rule book referred to this rule book that if you have a case that uses IDS, international data spaces reference architecture so why don't you uh, uh, in your use case uh, take uh, take this uh, citra model as one of the bases um to um, um finalize so so yeah uh, you know what it means marco <laughs> yes yes i know so to finalize so so there are a couple of uh, agricultural examples that i want to show here and we will hear more and more more about that in just a sec with the just connect but there are others like agri agri router in germany uh there is ag data hub in in uh, in france and uh, i've been personally involved in this network that's called that calls itself agri food data space finland but anyway, so there are these embryonic data spaces that are out there and we can start building the solutions, but it should be combination of the best of these good, good things that are already out there. So key messages, the common design principles can be applied for data spaces and, and we can start building these on, on common building blocks, but also the fair data economy rules are needed and those might be specific for use cases. Uh, and, and those be, need to be tailored as well, and that we can use these embryonic data spaces as a good starting point uh, to get these common European data spaces go. Thank you. Now, Nuria, ready for questions. Thank you very much, Marco, for the comprehensive presentation, and I would say also the very passionate presentation, which I love. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have more time and we cannot go in depth into the different concepts, but I think that you have provided already quite a lot of tips and guidance for people. I think that the main purpose of today is not to talk again, as I mentioned in the beginning, about the what, more requirements and needs, but to provide some guidance to people who want to start building these data spaces or want to have a reference on people that have already been working on that. And you have mentioned quite a lot of these things, so thank you very much for that. And uh, with this, I think that we finished the first session that was intended to provide uh, the background and setting the scene. And we go now to a session where, unfortunately, all my speakers will be angry at me because uh, they will really have a very short time for the presentations. And the main intention is not to present everything in detail, which is impossible, as I mentioned in the introduction, but basically to provide some pointers to some of the work that is already being done in order not to reinvent the wheel and to reuse many of these works that could already be good building blocks or assets for the future data spaces. And without further delay, I would like to give the floor to Joanna Rusaki from uh, the National Technical University of Athens. She's working in the Demeter project and is going to talk to us about data models, which is one of the important aspects of uh, the semantic interoperability. So Joanna, the floor is yours and tell us a bit about what is it and in which way it can be used by people, by the community. Thank you very much for the introduction, Nuria. Um, I'm Joanna Rusnaki. I'm a professor at the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering of the National Technical University of Athens in Greece. And uh, I'm here to talk about uh, the approaches that have been adopted and uh, developed within the Demeter project, uh, where I lead the data and uh, knowledge uh, work package. 
I'm very sure that uh, you have heard uh, uh, about Demeter. However, I, I will spend one slide only to, to uh, say a few things. Uh, Demeter stands for uh, data-driven uh, innovation in the agri-food sector. Uh, you see here, it is a pretty uh, large scale project with 60 partners, uh, more than 5,000 5, farmers, uh, several thousands of uh, devices, uh, ranging from uh, small devices, sensors, uh, actuators, and so on, to large uh, machinery. Um, we, have, uh, uh, we are aiming to uh, establish, to implement interoperability across the agri-chain. And uh, for this purpose, we have developed one of our uh, key tools is the AIM, the rest of the presentation, uh, where the rest of the presentation will uh, focus on. Um, to, to validate our approaches, we have built, uh, we have uh, uh, planned for 20 pilots uh, structured in uh, five uh, clusters. So uh, one of our clusters focuses, for example, on water and energy related to arable crops. Another one uh, focuses on precision farming uh, with regards to um, uh, large agricultural machinery. We have uh, another one uh, focusing on crop uh, health uh, and quality in the food, fruit and vegetable sector, another one on uh, animal health, uh, dairy, and so on. And uh, we have uh, our, our last um, uh, pilot cluster being uh, cross-sectorial, uh, dealing with uh, different aspects across the entire uh, agri-food supply chain. Um, as I said, uh, one of my one of our uh, main uh, tools uh, in Demeter to deal with uh, interoperability is the uh, agricultural information model, the so-called AIM that we have uh, developed, that aims to establish the basis for a, for a common agricultural data space, uh, and, and thus to enable interoperation of, of different systems and. Um, uh, enable the analysis of data produced uh, by those systems in an, uh, an integrated uh, manner. Uh, as you see in this slide, uh, the, the AIM follows a modular approach in a, in a layered uh, architecture. And uh, we claim that it facilitates interoperability with existing models, a, a, a wide variety of existing models, um, supports alignment with uh, um, uh, external models, uh, by module instead of uh, um, with regard to the entire uh, model, um, extends uh, the uh, domain specific areas with additional uh, concepts, additional uh, uh, vocabulary, um, and uh, maps to top level cross domain ontologies. Um, as you see here in this uh, figure, we have uh, the top layer which is the, the core uh, metamodel layer. This actually adopts and reuses the well-known NGSI-LD metamodel, which is uh, standard by, by Etsy. However, as opposed to NGSI-LD, uh, the, the underlying uh, layers um, actually reuse uh, existing uh, standards, as you see in this uh, slide, implementing semantic referencing. So, uh, our goal here is to uh, support, to enable semantic interoperability by reusing as, as many relevant uh, and dominant standards as possible. Um, the uh, underlying layer is uh, the, the cross-domain uh, ontology layer. Uh, this actually defines uh, concepts and terms that are generic and applicable to, to various domains, not only the agri-food domain, you see here uh, the well-known SOSA SSN uh, for uh, the representation of uh, sensor uh, data. Um, you see here the, the OGC uh, geo uh, spark tool for the uh, geometric geographical representations. You see here the W3C time and so on. So we reuse as much as possible in the cross-domain uh, ontology layer underneath we have a domain specific ontology layer. This is uh, uh, specific to the agri-food sector. So anything, any data that comes from the agricultural uh, sector, uh, we model them here. However, uh, the information, the concepts modeled here uh, need to be quite common. 
in the agricultural uh, um, sector. Because for the very specific needs, we have an additional layer, the pilot specific. This is very, uh, this is constantly changing with the uh, extensions. We have now released two versions of this um, uh, uh, model uh, and now working in the third release, uh, the deliverable that has uh, actually um, presented the respective work has been released uh, uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago. And uh, at the lower layer, you see how, how many, uh, actually a subset of the standards and solutions that we build on and uh, for which uh, we, we uh, ensure semantic interoperability. So it's, it's a fiber that we mainly uh, build on in the domain specific layer, same stands also for SIRE for Agri, um, both uh, uh, standards. Uh, we also build on uh, the, the well-known INSPIRE, uh, the AgroVoc, uh, ADAPT, uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, vertically, you see our uh, metadata layer that also builds on the well-known and um, uh, already penetrated uh, solutions. Now, this is the last uh, slide. How, I, I believe you got the picture, how we, we um, support, well, how we facilitate semantic interoperability. Uh, there is a great deal of, of, of standardized solutions that we claim we are interoperable with. And our AIM is, is constantly being extended with additional concepts uh, coming from uh, additional standards and, and models. And uh, for example, yesterday we had a, a discussion uh, about how to, to extend the AIM to, to capture also concepts uh, with regards to CAP, to the Common Agricultural uh, Policy. Uh, that's, that's all from my side. I was planning to say a few things more, but <laughs> I felt very much There's behind. There's a problem of time, Joanna, but I think that you were quite clear with, uh, with the short time uh, that I have uh, given to you. Um, if people uh, want to contribute to this, uh, get in touch with Joanna. I'm also involved in the Demetra project, so we, I will also be happy to create the connections. And uh, the important thing is that uh, we really want to encourage collaboration, not to repeat the work. And basically what Joanna has described is really a collaboration work where we are basing uh, the work on top of other initiatives and trying to be interoperable with as many as possible. So we really encourage other people working in this domain, in data models, to get in touch with Joanna and, and collaborate with us. That would be great. So thank you very much, Joanna. I think there will be an opportunity to, to organize more sessions and we will go more in detail. Nuria, yeah. if I add one word, this is available, you can use it. It's already available in the Agro portal. It's already available on the OTC server. So if you're interested in finding out what it is about and even uh, using it in your developments, uh, it, it's public and it's available. Thank you. Thank you, exactly. That is the kind of information I want speakers to provide because today we can provide just some hints and the pointers and then people can really go there and, and check if that fits their purpose. Thank you very much, Joanna. Now I would like to invite um, Thanos Elias. He's working for INVO. And in fact, uh, he's working on an initiative that was mentioned before by Marco, the Just Connect, which is one of what we call embryonic data spaces. So. In uh, Panos, you have already some experience somehow in this initial concept of data spaces. Tell us a bit uh, what has been done, what is the current status of the development, in which way it can be used, and how our colleagues in the session today can learn from what you, you've been doing. Okay, hello everybody. I hope you can hear me and you can see my presentation. Is that okay? <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nuria. And, um, uh, also the other presenters, uh, especially Marco, because he did an introduction for, for Just Connect. Um, well, Just Connect, it's, uh, it's a data sharing platform. Uh, it's a fairly missed initiative and it focus, our main focus is to support the agri community of Flanders to, to proceed further with data sharing. So we want to facilitate data sharing and how we're doing that by delivering a set of, of, of services uh, that can support the participants to publish their data resources, to establish agreements, uh, to perform um, transactions with verify actors, to control the access and the users of their resources, but also to monitor the transactions using uh, metadata. 
uh, participants in uh, in Just Connect they have roles, and we are inspired by the IDSA reference architecture model. And our priority is to support farmers perform um, in uh, in the skin of the of the upcoming data sharing and uh, data economy. Uh, the core service of the platform is related to the data authorization, and it's about data usage and control. Uh, what we have learned until now, the platform is in operational level, and uh, we we continue to, to to struggle. To we continue to to do our job. Uh, the main uh, lesson is that okay, if you need to govern as a platform that is like just connect, that is an outcome of the public-private partnership, it's not an easy case. Okay, you lose some flexibility. However, however, the collaboration between the main agricultural actors and the government can deliver stability and trust in the agri-food community and the farmers. Uh, there is a need to invest in awareness. We need to explain uh, to our community what is data economy. Uh, we, we are doing webinars. We try to, to, to give up, uh, clear answers to specific questions. How can I use my data? How can I build a revenue model for data sharing? Uh, another thing that we're doing, and I think it's, it works, it's, it's to demonstrate the added value. We try to have some quick wins and to, to show, to build application and, and demonstrate to the farmers what they can do with data sharing. And also, we mainly focus uh, on uh, the development of core services uh, that makes a difference for our community. That means, and it's also uh, a key message, that uh, we consider ourselves, we consider uh, Just Connect as a node in the data space. It's not, an, uh, it's not uh, we don't consider ourselves as an agricultural data space. And uh, we believe that uh, by federation of, of, of services or by decentralization, we can achieve uh, uh, not only better services for our community, but also an economic sustainability. Another message is that uh, the intermediaries like Just Connect can support stakeholder engagements and they can empower their position in the agricultural data economy. However, the economic sustainability of this platform is not for granted. So uh, public funding is needed. Until now, we're using public funding, we participate in calls, uh, uh, and we try to uh, national and European calls and we try to support our operation by using public funding, but also money coming from the, from the private sectors. Um, public funding also needs to, to, to provide other conditions. Uh, we respect uh, uh, and we follow the, uh, the Data Governance Act. We believe that uh, intermediaries need to respect uh, the design principles of, of, uh, of a data space, they need to, to respect the fair principles for findability, accessibility, interoperability, reusability, uh, and this is very important also. Um, and, sorry, and also uh, the last one message is that uh, we believe that the adoption of a self sovereignty identity uh, model can really support uh, not only platforms but also the whole community uh, because it can deliver um, uh, the needed interoperability and can empower the position of the farmers and the farmers this way but also other actors they can perform cross-border uh, transactions which is not the case right now for for just connect um, thank you nuria i have to Okay. To complete perfect. my presentation, but I I have to. Okay, maybe I keep, I cannot. Okay. You have uh, a phone call. I. Okay. I I think I made it. I stopped presentation. Okay. Yeah, in fact, it went beyond what I was expecting. So thank you very much also for for the time. Uh, can I make a very quick question to you, or you have to yeah. leave Panos? No, no. I. I so I'm just for it. clarification, you've mentioned that this platform is in production. So is it something that can already be used by farmers, at least in your region, in the Flemish region of Belgium? They already use the platform. They already uh, use the platform. For and more than is, a year, yes. We, and we, who is operating the platform in terms of institution? Who is really operating the infrastructure, the platform as such? Right now, the platform is being operated by Ilvo. 
uh, I belong of the I'm, I'm, I'm the architect and I participate in this team. Uh, mm -hmm. We are also working together with uh, with an IT company, with our contractor, it's Zika, uh, but the platform is being operated by Ilvo. And uh, in the governance of this platform, uh, we have also a group of companies that participate, we make decisions together, uh, but the responsibility for the operation, is, it belongs to Ilvo. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. In fact, I have a lot of questions. Let's see if at the end we have a bit of time. You went even beyond uh, the pure design of the platform. Are you already operating that? So, of course, it's very good because uh, you can also bring key messages in terms of sustainability. So, thank you very much for that, Panos. Let's go now because of time limitation to burn. So our next speaker will bring a, is bringing a use case also in agriculture, in this case in Germany. And in fact, Bern is also working in the German node of Gaia X. Today, we don't have time to go in depth in Gaia X, which I know that is a topic of high interest to many of the colleagues here. But, uh, but he will tell us a bit about some of the, the works that they are doing in agriculture and maybe to provide some links if possible with what it means to be interoperable with Gaia X. So Bern, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Noya. So firstly, um, I'm not directly working uh, in Gaia X, but I'm loosely connected to the activities. So I'd like to share my screen. I think- um, Yeah, Panos, I think you have to, to stop your presentation yes. I think, so that we can see the one of Bern. I hope you are with us and you are listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> Panos? <laughs> um, oh, okay. ah, now, perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much. So now you can do it. So I hope you can see my screen. Yeah, it works. And problems. Okay. So um, my name is Bernd Rauch. I'm working for uh, Fraunhofer in Germany. It's a research um, organization and we are distributed in a lot of single institutes and I'm working for uh, Fraunhofer IESE, which is a software engineering institute in Kaiserslautern. And we um, are very much occupied with topics like data um, ecosystems, uh, digital platforms, digital ecosystems, um, software architecture and so on and so forth. Um, we do a lot of activities and we are head or project lead of the Fraunhofer Lighthouse project, which spans above a lot of um, Fraunhofer institutes, which is called Cognac or Cognitive Agriculture and Long. So it's a Fraunhofer internal research project on smart farming. Um, we are doing currently until next year, August, um, which is only one of our activities currently in smart farming. So we are engage in other um, activities, but I just brought Cognac for today. So Cognac has one major aspect, which is the agricultural data space. Um, we called it ADS before the, the term became pretty common in discussion. So um, we don't claim to, to invent it, but um, it's, it's a core concept in our research. So I'm leaving out a lot of details and just going to what we are working on. And I brought especially one aspect of what we are working on in Cognac. So don't be disappointed if you think that's all. Um, nevertheless, it's, it's um, hard enough to, to work this out thoroughly. So for the agriculture data space, after three years of research so far, we um, identified a big problem, which is a lot of ecosystems uh, in this domain ecosystem of agriculture are still isolated. So you have platforms like um, my John Deere, where machinery from uh, the manufacturer, John Deere is, um, is um, connected to, or for class, there's the same. Um, you have this 365 farm net with class telematics, and there are many others. So the slide was too small to put all of them, of them here. So it's just an exemplary illustration. Um, we have farm management systems like Next Farming, at least in Germany. Um, where farmers can use the software on a platform like service um, to, to operate their uh, farms. And you have something we heard earlier in another presentation, uh, the AgriRouter, which is an agri-routing service um, where you can um, route data from systems or applications to farmers, farmer systems, and so on and so forth. And this is basically a very high level abstraction of the digital ecosystem where participants like service operators or users like farmers are connected in single uh, digital ecosystems which are only loosely connected and um, this brings us, us to a typical practical problem if you have an asset like a field 
and this field generates data because you work with machinery from John Deere on this field on glass and you have uh, data from this field in your farm management system. This data typically is uh, distributed. It's distributed in different ecosystems and in different databases. This is a problem. Um, we had it um, as well today. If you want to have control um, for the data owners, so if the data owner of this uh, or the owner of this physical asset and reclaim it's the, the owner of the corresponding data, um, it's very hard for you to have control and maintain control over your data that's typically distributed in a lot of um, data pods. Uh, another thing that's an, a challenge is if you want to use um, comprehensive applications like decision support systems or the like, um, those typically need a lot of big data um, to, to, to calculate um, what the algorithms are predicting or whatever. And um, if you are in such a distributed scenario, it's hard for you to get all the data you need. So our approach, one of the things we're working on is to uh, design something we call a data hub for digital twins. We heard the idea of digital twin again in, uh, in earlier presentations. So I suspect we are not on the totally wrong path here. Um, and we um, currently are designing something for the ecosystem that resembles something like data hub for digital twins, um, digital field twins in this um, um, scenario, but you can extend this idea of digital twins um, virtually for everything um, in the context of farms. So um, aspects to watch here, we don't design an additional service that's part of this domain ecosystem, um, which is an independent service solely. It can be that you offer this one as a, a, an additional service in the ecosystem, but it can also be integrated in the existing platform here, here, or wherever. So this is due to that you have uh, different requirements from the actors in the ecosystem, and we want to um, come up with solutions that are uh, on a high level of acceptance um, by the stakeholders. Why we are designing such a thing? We have two uh, key aspects in, in focus, which are data sovereignty and interoperability. So data sovereignty, our approach would say, if you uh, bring together all the data at one place in a twin linked to a physical asset, it's um, much easier for the owners of this data to maintain the control of the data. So it, there's a connection of your asset and the data that's connected to it. And the next thing is interoperability can be done as a hub service. So if you have no thorough infrastructure for the connections here, 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 um, you can have connectors here at this side and um, interoperability could be a service of this hub. Um, we're still working on ideas how to uh, reach this interoperability, but we um, heard interesting um, aspects on this topic as well. We think uh, an additional standard or a big standard that that's um, that's here for everything is might not be the best solution as this as it is too inflexible. So our approach would be to have a more flexible um, solution via ontologies and mapping and so on, where you have coexistence of multiple standards in the domain um, and you can uh, map between those standards. Yeah. So um, Nuria asked me to talk about Gaia X or um, she wanted uh, us to, um, to give a presentation about Gaia X. Um, I can link some of our work to Gaia-X. Um, first of all, I'm not an expert of Gaia-X. Um, we participate in a lot of activities and calls, but um, I didn't read any piece of paper that's available on Gaia-X. And the other thing is that um, from our perspective, a lot of aspects still need to be defined and um, described in Gaia-X or developed. So um, I brought Two, two ideas which are key um, from my understanding of Gaia-X, which is one is the principles like interoperability, portability, sovereignty, and an openness. And another core concept is um, the federation services. So you have um, centralized services in Gaia-X network up to my understanding, um, which offers some certain functionality. The other thing is you have an architecture of standards and um, where you collect all the standards that are typically um, existing 
existing in a certain domain like agriculture and they should support by all players that want to participate in this uh, Gaia X domain. So to bring it in an, an illustration, which is my second last slide, um, I hope it's not too complex here, but um, if you think this is the old picture, um, if you think of Gaia X combining all those in common um, data, um, data space, um, those federation services can help you. So like if you are an actor or an ecosystem, you need to know with whom you are communicating and an identity service uh, can build up trust that you know um, who is your counterpart in your communication. That's one key uh, function I would see as essential in such a data space. Another thing is that you maintain a federated catalog um, if you are on the search for data. So if you want data for a specific field, you can ask um, um, or request this catalog, where is this data situated? And the Twin Hub can um, um, tell this catalog, okay, I keep the data for a certain field. And so they can match here and find each other. For the communication itself, you have this mentioned architecture of standards between um, all the players that want to interact with each other. And, and this is only a, a very small excerpt from what I understood of Gaia X, and, um, but it's um, elementary for, from my perspective to get a um, working um, a data space in agriculture. Thank you very much, Bernie. In fact, I like a lot your presentation because you have brought many of the concepts that we targeted before in, from a more conceptual point of view and you put them in a concrete operational environment of your use case. So I think that uh, you provided also some tips that are quite interesting for people that start implementation of these things. Mm -hmm. So thanks a lot. I think it was very comprehensive. Mm -hmm. And for Gaia X, we will organize for sure another session. Eh? This is one event, but for sure we can organize many things, as many as we think that the community needs. So in oh. any case, very much appreciated. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> and uh, just looking at the time, so we are already late. I should have imagined that from the very beginning. But uh, we, we still have three speakers. So I would like them, uh, I would like to give them the opportunity to talk, of course, because they were already included in the agenda. I will ask them to be brief. In any case, I know that you are getting a lot of information today. What is important to know is that this session is being recorded. It will be available and also all the presentations will be available after the session. So don't worry and you will be able to watch it again if you cannot stay till the end. However, I'm happy that I see that most of the audience is quite loyal and they are still connected. So with this, I would like to give the word now to Rafael Deloyo. He's working for Ita Innova in the, a project called Grapevine, and it's a case that he will present today. So, Rafael, thank you very much for accepting the invitation, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Noria. Thank you for inviting me. I will try to make uh, the presentation as fast as possible, try to, to go to the, the, the main points. So, the first thing is the Grapevine project. So, the grape uh, buying project uh, objective is improving current best predictions and control system in the wine sector. So, thanks to big data and artificial intelligence, so our idea is try to to consuming data and generation data. So, uh, from four first pers for four perspective from the farmers, uh, grape bank provides open information to the farmer, so they can apply you know, more effective treatment. For the companies, uh, Grapevine provides new services to be potentially useful for any region with similar issues. For the technician, from the uh, agriculture technician, the Grapevine is oriented to help and support crop management and protection, so with prevention and monitoring tools. And for the scientific com uh, communities, uh, Grapevine uh, uh, will promote the using of existing open data, HPC, and data infrastructure to enhance agricultural sector. So uh, I will try to, to explain uh, in, in, two, in two ideas. Uh, uh, first, we have a lot of resources, data resources now, like Copernicus images, drone images, IoT images, open data images. And we have uh, the, the big data, uh, infrastructure, and uh, we have deployed during the buying infrastructure for the, pro the project. And we have also in the project, we have HPC uh, computing, and we have uh, artificial intelligence algorithms. So uh, we mix both and we try to, to predict the, the main tests in the wide sector. 
think that the, the wine sector is one of the, the most important uh, agriculture sector in Europe. So we, with this information goes to the, to the farmer. We offer farmers data to make more fruit and more crops. So the, the result of this project is the, the data uh, centered in the farmer. So we offer this information to the, to the farmer to, to, to make more fruit and more, to, to make a smart, a smart agriculture. So this is the, the, the main idea of the, of the project. What, what lesson we have learned? So uh, we have a huge quantity of open data available in agriculture. So uh, we can find a lot of information, open data, and also closed data. So uh, the main problem is it's not homogeneous. We can find a lot of information, for example, in Spain, but in this not, or in, in some part of the Europe, you don't have any data available. So also, I think it's very important, the quality of the data. So if you want to get value from the data, you need quality of data. You need resolution in the images. You need information to, to the enough quality to generate models. Uh, it's not easy to find. It's, 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 it's difficult because you, you have distributed all information of data today in, in Europe. And uh, you find uh, raw data. So, uh, okay, we, we know that there are a lot of semantic standards. We, we talk a lot about the, the semantic layer for integrations, especially in, in, in IoT. But not too many companies offer this uh, semantic standard in the in the data, or it's not available because normally you have raw data, you don't have semantic annotated data. So we we have a lot a lot effort in the project to transforming data, to change the data to to be consumed for the for the for the machine learning algorithms. So we have sometimes to to reinvent the, the wheel sometimes. So we need to change that. And, and that a lot of public open data, but not exactly private data. It's difficult to find private data. So uh, we need to find business model for the private data to be available, this, this data. And finally, uh, just that uh, we expect from the European data spaces, from the territory of the data space for the for agriculture. So we need uh, services in that in, in, in that data space, in that ter territory. Especially, we need high quality of data to be consumed, and we need a, a clear semantic standard for this data. So it's, if we need to consume data and we want to generate services on this data. Uh, we need a clear semantic interoperability. We need open data and we need to, to make uh, that uh, Marco said before, uh, we need to center the data in the user. What we offer with your mind? Now we have a service. We are, we are just we are in the middle of the project and we have the, the first services for, for prediction. We have made a lot of work in make a quality data from the from the Copernicus, from the from the open data, from the IoT. So we have learned a lot, and we have a, a, we are going to to make the results in, in semantic standard. We want to present the results obtained in, in semantic standard, and make everything open data. So we are going to try to involve to the to the different set, to the different uh, farmers in in the culture of the open data to improve the to improve the results of the project. And thank you very much. Uh, you have a lot of information in the, the website and, and in, in, the, in, the, in the project. So you can ask me if you have any, any doubt on the project. Thank you very much, Rafa. I think that since your project is in a still a, a, an early stage, maybe you can also benefit from some of the assets that some of the colleagues have mentioned before. I, I don't know if uh, it can be reused or not, but I think that uh, you can have a look at that. And maybe there is even the opportunity to foster collaboration between the projects and the initiatives that are presenting today. Sure, I think it's, 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 it's a, a good idea to, to try to start contacting, to, to see how to, 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 to provide data for this, uh, this territory.
of mm -hmm. other sources. Perfect. So then, Rafa, from you, we jump directly to Giuseppe Vela. He works for Engineering Engineering Informatica. And, uh, and Giuseppe, uh, tell us uh, what you are going to present today. Again, I'm sorry that we are yes. running now like this. I saw also that in the system we have four questions. So I would also like to, to give the chance for some of the speakers to answer the questions afterwards. So that's why I'm okay. also running. I'm sorry about that. I will present the, the Agribit project. Uh, the Agribit uh, project is uh, we will start. Uh, we start in a few months, uh, but we would like to talk about the experience of the at least of the project, our ideas that we submitted uh, in the, during the, the proposal phase. Uh, essentially, uh, here I start directly with the two uh, important points that you highlighted also in the initial presentation. So, which are uh, what is for us the, an agricultural data space, and which are or can be or will be the uh, the, the essential building blocks of this uh, uh, agricultural data space? I gave this kind of uh, let's say categorization or listing, but we can summarize them by uh, following in mind four main topics that are essentially services. That can be uh, that could be can be or uh, have already been done according also to the previous experience, uh, uh, given as a available a catalog of software that can be reused by third parties, a, a data model that can be used to structure the model and uh, a semantic interoperability mechanism that we have already heard that we will uh, we could use for the exchange of data uh, to, that could allow, for example, to connect a heterogeneous data source, uh, but also to infer new knowledge, new knowledge thanks to the experience that, they be, that can be exchanged, for example, through an agricultural situation awareness. Meaning that this could uh, uh, fit very well also with uh, no, uh, the, the, the presentation that was done before about the uh, digital twin hub where for example many farmers could connect among them to share their experience their data but also to give advice according to a very similar case in case there are some uh, potential risks uh, in uh, in farms that can be of course uh, overcome uh, by uh, thanks to the experience that the other farmers can uh, can share and last but not least, of course, uh, over uh, on top of everything, there will be so uh, the explainable artificial intelligence that we think that could be very important, thanks also to the experience uh, that the user could put uh, on such uh, intermediate results that can be provided by uh, intelligence algorithm applied to ag agricultural data space processing. Uh, as, as we said, the Agribit, uh, the Agribit project uh, is done is a very, very little consortium done by eight companies. And uh, what we want to highlight here is that uh, we apply artificial intelligence to precision farming by using GNSS uh, integrated and integrated technologies, but also to use uh, uh, Copernicus information to improve uh, the precision of services that will elaborate data coming from the field, but also from the space. Uh, last but not least, of course, we will test with three pilots in Italy, Greece and Portugal uh, for more than 50% of the, of the project time. Uh, here we put the aggregate space data for data spaces. That's why, because we talk about Copernicus data, we, we talk about uh, uh, Galileo's data. So the idea is here to create higher precision location services that could, for example, help uh, the system to, to have uh, uh, route planning to, to, do, to perform some, uh, some precision actions on the, on the crop or to have, uh, uh, for example, the, the more precise boundary extraction to monitor uh, a very strictly data. So we, we, we go from the, the wall field that can be monitored either to, uh, to, to surface that can go, for example, to 20 uh, to 30 sorry, centimeters uh, of areas. This uh, can improve, of course, the monitoring of the, of the pest, but can also improve some operations like uh, the tillage, the irrigation, or to monitor the, to monitor the crop the crop growth and so on, e to bundle of course the, the 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 precision agriculture services for farmers and for farm advisors by using a, a digital agriculture innovation hub, 
and uh, also to have uh, an open service oriented platform architecture to integrate uh, uh, to integrate not only the intelligence and uh, art artificial intelligence services that can exploit uh, the data coming from the field from the space but but also to integrate uh, uh, in this platform uh, uh, third party or provider services here we have uh, uh, agribit in a nutshell Giuseppe, where we talk i see a slide there yes. with with this slide, you can be talking for 10 minutes, <laughs> I think. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. But just uh, big blocks. Uh, the, uh, I, I will talk all about the, the light blue blocks. That is the cross-platform <laughs> visualization that is uh, uh, mainly related to the uh, services uh, related to the precision agricultural services, uh, but also to uh, the GNSS enablers that will be developed during the project. And from the other side, we will talk about uh, all the services that all the data that comes from Copernicus, from Sentinel-1, 2 and 3, but also at the same time that we will provide some more information to the Copernicus con uh, mission Landsat or Eometsat uh, products, uh, providing also some more data and uh, having in, in this sort of initial catalog some uh, uh, services that could go from the vegetation indices to the soil moisture, or to the uh, lay estimation, the biomass estimation. That's all. Thank you very much, Giuseppe. We will also keep an eye on your project. One of the things that we plan to do in the context of the subworking group of uh, agriculture in BDVA is also to create a catalog with all these assets that are being generated by the project so that you can find links to the different building blocks and, and in general assets that can be used uh, in any of the levels of the, of the platforms for the data spaces. So thanks, Giuseppe. I think your project will also be a, a good contributor to this. And with this, we go directly to the last speaker of our session today. Mariano, you will have the pleasure of providing the final remarks. And uh, we don't have much time. Jaco needs to leave at six. Uh, some of us need to leave at six. And I would like still to give the opportunity to answer some of the questions of the audience. So Mariano, share your screen as soon as you can. And then um, one of the important things that you bring on board today is that um, you also work for the public administration and you are coordinating a project called NIVA that is dealing with the common agriculture policy, which is uh, something that we have not discussed today, but that could also be a factor to take into consideration for the design of these data spaces. Okay, so, so Mariano, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Nuria, for your introduction. Then I don't need to introduce myself. <laughs> and thank you also to the audience for staying connected. Uh, well, I'll now we'll try to, to share um, some findings and, and hints that we uh, that we learn in the different projects in, in NIVA and, and also in the method. But now I would like to, to share more the outcomes from, from NIVA. Well, based on the experience of reading the, the, the different position paper from the BDBA, I saw that there is um, a data sharing value wheel, which is uh, uh, very good uh, to, to see which are the key pillars and the principles for, for this data sharing. Uh, so it's uh, a, a good uh, a starting point, a good approach. Uh, however, I have a couple of questions. Um, which are the stakeholders that are really uh, strong on, on that, on the different pillars or more than one? And the second question is, uh, at which level are we talking about uh, uh, those stakeholders? Are they uh, local, national, or international? So as uh, Martin said also uh, at the beginning, the territorial aspect uh, is very important. And I think this the agro sector or the rural areas have to consider also the social spaces at, at local area and the stakeholders that are very close to, to, to them. So we used to think about a global market and we used to think about uh, uh, stakeholders belonging to a chain, more or less, a production chain. But I think it's important also under this multi-actor approach that, that is being fostered by the DG Agri uh, to consider also the social spaces at local level with the stakeholders that are strong in the social space, uh, how they represent, the, the how strong they are in the different pillars also for the social space, which is market policy, technology, society, and infrastructure. It's also too important. It's also very important to know which are the stakeholders uh, there uh, and how to uh, address agreements with them for the data sharing. 
So those stakeholders have to be well balanced and weighted because if not, sometimes this uh, bottom up and open innovation approach that we are looking for uh, becomes top down again. So this is what we discovered in, in, in EVA project, which is a project that involves uh, more than 11 paging agencies in nine European countries uh, that moves from the old one to the new one that is not only agriculture, it's also dealing with the uh, environment and green deal as, as Doris mentioned also this morning. So in this sense, we found uh, all those components might be uh, available in the different systems in the agro sector. Uh, it depends on which kind of a stakeholder you are. Uh, however, we discover again, uh, a chicken and egg problem or a bottleneck, because uh, if we consider that, okay, there are many components that are more part of the Ajax uh, for the paging agencies to, to monitor what is happening in, the, in, in all the, the farms and to monitor all the agro-environmental indicators and to, to monitor everything. And we have uh, evolved a lot in NIVA projects in different harmonization that facilitates interoperability and data sharing, for example, the uh, crop or Lucas for, for the crop list or uh, publishing through Inspire many LPs information or the linked open data infrastructure that we can deploy. If we go to the right side and we see which are the ICT infrastructure or the EO infrastructure like Copernicus Galileo, you are talking now about Gaia, although it can, might be a distributed infrastructure uh, with twins. Also, the the uh, the uh, the, uh, the uh, Europe uh, facilities for the um, uh, linked open data infrastructure are also distributed infrastructures or the HPC infrastructures. And now we see also that the enablers of the data sharing infrastructures uh, uh, have to facilitate the connection between them. If we go, if we go to the farmer side, then again, uh, we see that the, the, the FMEs uh, can be very different per farmer, per country, uh, it depends. So uh, many of them include IoT, machinery, geotagged images, DSS, field books, or all those components. But again, uh, for us, the bottleneck is how to link them between the different components, uh, how to solve this uh, Bermuda Triangle. Because uh, if we go to the paying agencies, they want to monitor 100% of the territory. And they can do a lot with the Copernicus infrastructure. However, without the feedback of the farmer, they cannot progress more because they have to monitor more considering uh, information from farmer when they irrigate uh, the, the crop, uh, uh, when the, they fertilize, many information. Uh, also, the, the farmers sometimes do not have enough skills uh, to, to manage this uh, information have, have to be have to belong to a, a farmer association or, or FMEs providers that can deal with that. And also the infrastructures cannot uh, work alone because all the services have to be trained through a specific examples per country and per farmer. So again, some many of those components it's not clear yet if they are in the Ajax side, in the infrastructure side, in the farmer side, or in all of them. So this is one thing that I think that have to be solved in the future uh, <laughs> agro data spaces. So that, that's my, my thoughts at this stage. Thank you. Maria. Thank you very much, Mariano. So you bring additional questions that we cannot answer today, but of course it's very good input for the next session that we will organize. So as mentioned in the beginning, this is just a teaser or, or a seed for something that, that can be worked out later on in additional sessions. Let me, before we finalize the session, at least go to a couple of questions, uh, because in fact we got many in the Q&A section of WOBA, but I would like to start with this one. Should And, and then uh, any of the speakers that feel that they can answer, I, I would be pleased uh, to get your, your opinion about that. Probably this one could be answered by Ilvo, I'm not sure, let's see, Panos. Should data sharing be based on contracts already in GDPR agreements? In practice, we know this is costing months or even years to manage. So how do you look at smart contracts and how attribute-based access control. How is, well, who is paying, who is making money in such data spaces in Agri? Should it be completely fair? So I mentioned Panos because at least you are already operating the platform and, and you have already gone through this 
problems or through these issues. So I'm not sure if you want to share your experience regarding these questions. What do you think yeah. about that? Well, about the contracts. Um, in reality, if you have one from one side the provider and the other side you have a consumer, and in the middle you have a farmer, they need to have a contract. Uh, they need to have a contract with the platform itself. They need to respect, respect the terms and conditions of the platform, the pricing model, and they also need to respect uh, the scope of, of the usage, the time period, and other terms. Uh, for me, that is the definition of a contract. How you can do it, I believe if you have a template and you have, uh, if you try to force and uh, increase the awareness uh, at the end, you will have a contract. I don't think it will take months or years. Uh, I think we have to deal data sharing as another transaction. Um, we spent here in Flanders one month or less to buy a house. We don't need to spend one year just to, to share an API. I think it's, it's our responsibility to, to proceed further with that. And about the usage control and the, data and the access control, uh, this is about trust. So if you, if you deliver services that uh, enforce from a technical perspective trust, then you can reach uh, the goal, which is to have a contract and start doing the transaction. It doesn't mean that it's easy. It's not easy. It's very hard and we spent uh, uh, the last two years, we, uh, the, we have spent more time not to build the platform, but to increase the awareness of the community mm -hmm. and to deal with the business model, to, to, to develop the terms and conditions, to speak to, with the lawyers. Um, but at the end, you will go there. I believe you, Panos. Here, there is another question that is obviously for you. How are the farmers in Flanders using your platform? Very curious about the type of data services and interactions that bring most, most of the value in agri. So what is the relationship and interaction right with now, farmers? The, the farmers in, in Flanders, we start with, with uh, one uh, use case is with the uh, development of, a, of an application called IKMNet. IKMNet gives the ability to the farmers to certify themselves. Uh, and for that, until now, it was needed to, to collect data from many different sources. So what we did, we, we tried to bring all the providers together uh, and um, uh, to create an application that is going to that is using the uh, the, uh, the access control and the and the and the usage control services of just connected data authorization, and uh, this way the farmers they give their permission to their their consent to the providers to to share their data with the auditors. That was the first use case, and the acceptance is 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 very good. Uh, and uh, but we continue. We continue with other use cases related to with food, um, and uh, also focus on simple things. So uh, we don't focus a lot on IoT data or precision agriculture, but mainly also to deal with administrative things to reduce the burden, uh, the, the administrative burden of, of the farmers. Um, that is a nice way to demonstrate the, the effectiveness of data sharing. Thank you very much. I opened this one to all the colleagues. Maybe Bern could be a bit a good one to, to answer. Do you actually need to share data or only higher level aggregated insights? And how unique is agricultural data, I suppose, in comparison to data sets from other sectors? And how much does it vary? What is the added value that data sharing provides also from one farmer to another farmer? In fact, that's interesting because I've seen lots of cases where we are using digital technologies to reinforce the usage of data, but I don't see so many use cases where farmers are sharing data. So, Bern, what is your experience in the use case that uh, in the use cases you have in Germany, and and what do you think? Uh, do we need to share the data as such, or or maybe the data, or even a higher level aggregated insights? Well, I think the, the best answer to this question is it depends. Um, there is no general answer to it, as the use cases. I know at least very, very too much. So in our project, we have, for example, a, a, a tough discussion on what, if you if you think again of the digital twin, which we see as a core where um, a lot of data is consolidated and that can be reused by other stakeholders or other farmers. And the question always is, um, what's part of 
something that, that, that describes a physical asset like a field and what's not. So um, for example, we have a use case where uh, robots take um, uh, photos imaginary with hyperspectral cameras. And this is very specific data. And um, it's very hard to define if anybody else can reuse this data as it is, um, or if you can reuse an aggregated version of it. So we discuss it because it's uh, it's hard to store and to transfer this data. And a digital image from a hyperspectral camera is uh, can be a lot of megabyte up to gigabyte large. And it's hard to transport this over the internet in the cloud. And um, so you would say, okay, then let's aggregate it. But the partners from the use case say, if you if you somehow abstract from the original data, you lose a lot of information that could be interesting for other use cases as well. So I think there is no good answer where you can say um, it's only necessary to share this or that portion of data. Um, you always have to look what do you want to um, achieve with your um, certain use case and what input data would you need for that. And that's the data you should share. Mm -hmm. Okay, very wise answer. Thank you very much, Bern. Mm -hmm. Then, Rafael, this one is for you for the Great Bank project. Are you also linking your data insights to intervention? Um, so I think that uh, this is that uh, if you uh, uh, analytics or prescriptive analytics, you are linking basically the analytics with, uh, with the decision making for the farmers. So, Rafael, are you linking your data insights to interventions? Okay, uh, I, if I understand correctly, uh, it's uh, regarding the, the analytic part, I understand. It's, uh, um, in the case of, of, the, of the data, uh, when uh, we are getting information directly from the, from the farmers, um, because for, for the farmers, it's very important to transmit information about the pest. In, in Aragon, in our region, the wine, the, the, the farmers need uh, to identify who is the, the farmer with the, the, the initial point of, of the pest. So it's very important to, to communicate this information. In our case, uh, we are trying to predict, to, to predict uh, days before, weeks before, and we are uh, trying to, 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 to predict uh, three weeks be before that the pest starts in the in the crops so this information is is is, is very important for for the farmers to 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 try to identify the the the, the pest and then to 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 put the, the the correct treatment for that so are you suggesting actions to to the farmers uh, it's clear the the farm the because it's uh, in 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 the case of the wine depends of the farm the, depends of the of the pest you have a specific treatments so we are uh, we are uh, predicting five different pests five different diseases so is uh, the the treatment is clear for the different diseases today okay thank you maybe i will interpret uh, the question we got i think this is uh, the last one we will cover now i think most of them we covered the others um which is should farmers become data crunchers? I think that uh, Doris, I would like to get your opinion about this because it also uh, relates somehow to, to the plans to support small, small farmers. So I think that in Europe, we all acknowledge that there are some very big farms, but also a lot of small farmers and probably their needs and requirements are different. Do you have uh, like plans that somehow segment these different kind of farmers with some specific actions looking at small farmers? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. I think what is to be considered if you go to the, let's say, technically advanced farmers, sometimes this is not necessarily the size of the farm, but the economic size. For instance, the, if you have vegetables, sometimes it's a small area, but you have a quite intensive or you have the capital to invest. If you have the opportunities to use census yourself, then you have another data need, like, for instance, commonly freely available satellite data has played another role in comparison for a small farm, which is not technically that advanced and cannot invest that much in own data generating um, technologies. So I think there is a main difference. And to be considered are those farmers which cannot afford 
to invest themselves in advanced sensors to generate additional data. So from a, a basic point of view, because it's still, um, let's say in many countries, uh, a high number of farmers who cannot buy the sensors to generate on ground data. So they benefit already from the freely available satellite data, for instance. And to think of about in the concept of developing a data space to have those farmers in mind which may join step by step and scale up the let's say technology step by step and start with the simple data the freely available data and to consider it and another dimension why it's valuable and that brings me um, back to the contribution by Bernd. Bernd um, had the example of the reference data from the agro robotics where he said, okay, um, whether it's valuable to have it for another component um, to, for instance, combine it with freely available satellite data and data technologies to further analyze um, data sets which are freely available and have more reference data, that is then of added value for those small farmers who cannot afford to buy um, sensor data. So meaning if we apply more data technologies for certain reference data, which has been generated at the ground, we can generate data sets which are of added value for those farmers which cannot afford to buy sensors on the ground. Thank you very much, Doris. I think that with your statement, we finalized this session today. I see that we really went much beyond the time that was planned for this session. I really thank all the speakers and the attendees for staying with us until so late. And uh, well, as mentioned, this is a starting point. So let's continue working on this topic. And uh, please, uh, if you are interested in contributing, since we will organize additional sessions and additional workshops, please get in touch with us. And we will be really happy to get additional views and additional projects on board in this collaboration exercise. Thank you, Doris, uh, to represent the commission today. Thank to all the colleagues uh, for representing different countries, different initiatives. And uh, have a very good afternoon and good evening to all of you. And as you know, the Data Week is continuing today. Day, tomorrow and also on Thursday. So a lot of interesting discussions on data will happen along these days. Thanks for your contributions and uh, have a very good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.